Good morning, everyone. I think uh, we are almost everyone is here. So you can start now. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jason, and I'm the senior product specialist from Nexus Analytics and in charge of certain analytical testing instruments and also Tinius Ocean testing instruments. Today, I will be your moderator. First of all, I would like to welcome you all for joining our Melkflow indexes and how to get accurate and repeatable test results webinar organized by Nexus Analytics with support from our principal partner, Genius Olsen. Thank you for spending your time with us. For today's webinar, we will be having two sections. In the first section, Mr. Harry Yun will be talk about the general introductions for Melkflow indexes and its working principles. Why do, for example, like why do we measure map flow rate and how does it improve the manufacturing process? We will also discuss different types of different standards, methods and results, how to get accurate, repeatable MFI test result and so on. I believe it will be a fruitful webinar presentation as Mr. Harry Yun has many years of experience in MFI. In the second section, we will be having the q and a section two just a little bit reminder before we are starting if you haven't mute your microphone or video please do it so before the presentation start so that we can have a lesser background noise during the presentation apart from that if you have any questions for our speakers during the presentations please type your questions in the chat box comment in below our speakers will answer your questions at the end of their presentation section or in the Q questions and answer sections later on. Furthermore, please help us to fill up the webinar feedback form in the chat box at the end of the webinar. Upon completion of the survey form, we will be sending you the presentation slides, webinar recording and e-certificate to you too. Thank you. Before that, let before I'm passing to Mr. Harry Yoon, let me introduce a little bit about his biography in this field. Mr. Harry Yoon served as product application specialist for Tinius Olsen since 1996, and he has 20 years of experience in the field of mechanicals and physical testing of plastic. He has many years of experience, I believe. In 1990, Harry became a member of ASTM International Committee T20 on Plastics, and he is now a vice chair of the committee. A group of about 1,000 members responsible for 473 standards. He is also subcommittee chairman for D20.30 on the thermal properties of plastic and chairman of D20.10 zero two impact properties as well as the chairman of several task groups within the committee. Hi, good morning, Mr. Harry. Now I will be passing the stage back to you. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you all for coming. Um, I appreciate you coming and spending your early morning here with us. Um, <clears throat> What we'll do today is kind of focus on um, belt flow index testing. And if I can get my screen to work. Everybody see it? Yes, Ken, Mr. Harry. Okay, good. And uh, as it was said, this is uh, me. Um, I've been uh, involved in uh, testing and uh, plastics for oh almost thirty years now. Um, this is uh, some of the committees that I'm on at ASTM and ISO. Um, I'm not a materials person, but uh, more mechanical, and uh, in my background. Um, so I work on in within ASTM. I work on the testing committees, which which is D2030 and D2010. 
within ISO. I am also a U.S. delegate on the SC2 uh, committee, which is mechanical testing, um, and also SC5, which is chemical and physical properties. Um, SC5, is, again, is not my strong suit, but I kind of uh, monitor it as a administrative function. So, but in testing is, is where uh, my um, expertise lies, I suppose. So uh, enough about me. We'll, we'll tell you a little bit about the company I work for, which is Tinius Olson. Um, we'll go over our, um, our expertise and we'll do a company. And then finally, we'll focus on the MP1200 melt flow indexer, which is our current model. Tinius Olson, the company, is a company that's now 130 years old. It was started in 1880 um, by Tinius Olson. Tinius Olson, the man, was a Norwegian immigrant to the United States um, and started the company. The, the story is that uh, while he was at a church meeting, his the boiler that you, they used to heat the uh, building exploded. And he wondered why that happened, so he invent, uh, invented a machine to test the strength of metal. And um, it's still uh, it, within the Olson family. We're still privately owned. Uh, the fifth generation um, is, man, is the current president of the company. That's the young man on the left-hand side of the picture. Um, that's Robert Tate. He's the president. Uh, we are uh, still in the Philadelphia area. We started in uh, the company started, uh, as I said, in 1880 in in Philadelphia, uh, and we moved to our current location, which is um, in Horsham, Pennsylvania. Uh, we moved there in 1948, and it was a old uh, a hangar building at a airfield that we moved into. And we're still there today. Um, here is the picture of uh, Tinius Olson's uh, ma main invention, the uh, little giant universal testing machine. This was uh, a machine um, that, uh, this particular machine was a machine that when I first started back in Tinius Olson, we got a call back in 1996, we got a call from a company that uh, had this machine and uh, wanted to know if uh, we were interested in obtaining it. And we were, we, uh, the local salesman and I rented a truck and went over and picked that up and brought it back to the company um, where our head engineer at the time, his father restored it back to original condition. Uh, and this machine now sits in the lobby at Tinius Olson and we can still calibrate this machine. Um, in addition to Tinius Olson, um, well, being in, located in the U.S., Tinius Olson being from Norway is quite famous back in Norway. Um, they actually set up a uh, Tinius Olson Technical College in Kongsberg, Norway, uh, which we still support. Um, and the family members um, go back and visit there often. We support them with equipment. Um, Tinny Solson has also grown. Uh, you see our our uh, offices in Horsham, which is very close to Philadelphia. So we kind of say we're in Philadelphia, but we also have place uh, a manufacturing site in uh, Red Hill, United Kingdom, and New Delhi in India. Last but not least, we also have a Tinius Olsen Shanghai, which uh, is a very busy place these days. Um, this shows uh, the, the building uh, with our showroom showing our line of equipment. And then um, this is just an overview that shows uh, 
where Tinius Olsen US, Tinius Olsen UK, Tinius Olsen India, and Tinius Olsen China are all located. So we do have a global presence and we've been in business for a very long time. Um, uh, we're not maybe as well known as some of the other companies out there, but uh, uh, we do seem to know what we're doing and we've been there a long time. So we do have technical expertise um, to back up our products. Uh, we have engineers uh, that design and manufacture our hardware, firmware, and software in-house. 30% um, of them are engaged in some sort of uh, technical committee work, whether it is, is in ASTM or ISO or uh, other standards organizations, bodies. Um, so, you know, there's, we, we also sell a lot of metal testing equipment. Um, so we also have people involved in both the ASTM uh, metals committee and the ISO metals committee. And um, all of our, we like to say, oh, you know, we're small enough that uh, all of us can talk to the customers when there's a question. Um, we may not have the answers right away, but we sure try and uh, get you the answers that you need. So that's that's the shortness short story about the company. So we'll get right into uh, what we're all here for tonight or today. Um, we'll get on the MP1200 um, melt indexer. Um, this is uh, the latest in a long line of, of machines. We've been making melt indexers since uh, the late 1940s um, in one form or another. Um, but this is the current model, and this slide just shows some of the various versions of them that are available, which we'll talk about. So, what is a melt flow indexer, or the technical name is the extrusion plastometer? Um, most people commonly know it as a melt indexer. What's shown here is the basic um, machine uh, in, I guess it's in the most basic form where you're just going to get a mass uh, measurement out of the machine. So looking at the melt flow rate, what is it? Well, it's also known as the melt flow index and the melt index, there's various names for it. Um, the current name seems to be, uh, the current name of choice seems to be the MFR test. Um, it is a common test performed to determine the melt flow properties of virgin compounds and resins um, under a particular shear stress, which is related to the um, load that's applied and the temperature at which, which it's tested. Uh, the melt flow rate and the MFR uh, is again the molten polymer. Uh, what happens during this test is that the molten polymer is heated uh, to a constant temperature under a specified load and and forced to flow through a a specified diameter orifice uh, by gravity. Um, test temperatures and test conditions, the test meaning the test temperature and test loads are dictated by the type of material. Uh, for example, polypropylene's easy. It's always going to be tested at 120 degrees C with a 2.16 kilogram test load. But polyethylene is one of those that has uh, many different conditions um, depending on uh, the type of polyethylene you're working with. Uh, the linear low runs at uh, 190 C with a 2.16 kilogram uh, test load, um, and you have other conditions, but then you can go up to um, the high density, high molecular weight material, which runs again at 190, but with a 2.1 or 21.6 kilogram test load. So um, you all, with with these two particular materials and and most materials, we try to get people to uh, when they ask us what test conditions they should use. 
we always kind of refer them to the material standards within ASTM, or the easiest thing is to check with the supplier and find out um, what test conditions they're using when they're selling you uh, material. So, but um, the units that are used to report melt flow are grams per 10 minutes. And that's for the melt flow rate. There is an alternative test uh, result that you can get, the melt flow volume rate. You see this uh, sometimes in those that are testing to ISO standards. Um, it is also the, a measured test, but you're measuring the volume of material that is ex extruded through a orifice under defined temperature and load conditions. Uh, and you end up with uh, units of cubic centimeters per 10 minutes. Again, this is uh, something that's it's I, I find it useful to testing because it, it makes things a little bit easier and can take out some operator involvement on it. But uh, um, people are used to seeing uh, MFR results in grants for 10 minutes. So moving on, we'll get into some questions about um, what we're going to talk about today, you know, uh, we want to talk about why we measure MFI and why do we uh, uh, why we measure melt flow rate and how does it improve your process? Um, then we want to get into the differences within the tests uh, test procedures. There's some of them have various procedures within the test methods, both ASTM and ISO do. And then we'll focus on uh, some techniques uh, to see that. Uh, how you can do this test so you get more repeatability and reproducibility out of it. So we'll start out with why, why we do this. I mean, commonly it's the most common, it's a resin supplier quality control check um, where you're looking for differences in flow rate um, due to polymerization or compounding. Um, it's also a material selection tool. Um, your marketing and sales uh, of the major resin producers will produce spec sheets um, to show that uh, to def and to differentiate against the different grades of materials that they sell. Um, and then the customers will use the test to make sure that they are getting uh, what they ordered from the supplier. So they're doing incoming resin inspections. Um, so they can look for things uh, like degradation that's caused by improper storage, improper uh, handling during transit, things like that. Um, other reasons why they do the test uh, for process monitoring. Um, when you're setting up uh, your injection molders or whatever processing equipment you're using, you need to know how the how the material is going to flow through it so that you make your parts correctly um, and generally a high melt flow rate indicates that the polymer will be very liquid and, and flow very easily at a given temperature where a lower melt flow rate uh, the material will not flow as easily and will require more effort to process so you need to know what you're dealing with so you can adjust your machine properly um, Another reason why people will do this test is they want to, if they're, if they're using recycled materials or, you know, uh, either stuff they buy or stuff they use uh, from their manufacturing process, they want to determine how much of that they can put back into the virgin resin before it starts affecting their products. So, unfortunately, there's no hard and fast rule about how much to do it, but everybody has to kind of do their own to find out um, how much material they can uh, regrind material they can put back into the virgin materials and still get good parts. Um, got ahead a little ahead of myself, but we're processing, uh, you know, again, back we're comparing good and bad parts. Um, we can use uh, to determine the extent of degradation as a result of the process, whereas um, people take 
a part they know is good and they'll run it and they'll see what the melt flow is and then compare it to a part they know it's bad where they'll grind it up and run it and see what the, the melt flow rate is there and then they can that gives them an idea that gives them a, a good and bad side so that they can um, run uh, subsequent tests and see where they are as opposed to their standard so but what you're looking for is like with degraded materials would generally flow um, high, at a faster rate since the molecular weight is reduced. Um, and this could cause a, a reduction in some of the physical properties such as impact strength or you know brittleness or something like that. Um, some instruments can also calculate shear rate uh, shear stress and viscosity and, and give you the result of center foot. It's, it's a calculation based on the melt flow. Um, the MP 1200s, all of them can do that if they're equipped with the um, automatic timing switch. <clears throat> Just a little note on melt flow rate and uh, molecular weight. Um, it'll give you an relative, uh, an, uh, an idea. It's not an absolute. It'll give you an idea of the relative molecular weight of the material. Of course, molecular weight refers to the length of the molecular chain of the resin. It can't tell you it can't tell you the absolute length of the chain, but it can give you an idea of the length of the chain when you're comparing it to another resin. <clears throat> so polymer chains with the short length and and simple ge geometry tend to move fairly easily uh, against one another and you have of a higher flow rate because there's little flow resistance where conversely the longer chains and the more complex structure give you greater flow through resistance of, of viscosity. <clears throat> Excuse me there. All right, so to continue on the relationship between the melt flow rate and the molecular weight uh, is such that the uh, low molecular weight materials will give you the high values, as we said. Um, again, the melt flow rate, uh, and these are generally terms, this is, this is not again an absolute, but it is usually higher for materials uh, that have been processed just because of the, the changes that go on at the molecular level with the processing, uh, comparing that to virgin resin. And it, like we said, it's an indication, it will be an indication of the degradation, um, but it, it can only tell you uh, if something is going on. It cannot tell you why, and it cannot tell you how much degradation has occurred. So getting back to some to the, the test as are all, all there are some limitations to this test to the melt flow test. Um, uh, first off, it does not give you a lot of information about uh, the shear rate dependence unless unless you're doing a lot of tests at different le levels of force. And um, most of you probably don't have time to do that kind of work. Um, it does not come close to uh, generating the amount of shear or the shear rates that are seen in um, most modern process equipment. So if you really want to get uh, more accurately, uh, more accurate characterization, of your process ability, you probably should be looking at buying a capillarometer, um, which gives you multi-point measurements under varying loads um, to give you a shear and vis a shear viscosity curve. Um, but you got to remember that these are are more expensive than the melt indexer. The melt indexer has its place in in uh, our industry, um, but it does have its limitations. So getting into the testing specifications, there are two major uh, standards that uh, cover the melt flow test. And the first one being ASTM D1238. 
and the second being ISO 1133. Um, um, basically, they measure the same properties, but there are slight procedural and slight equipment changes that can give you differences in results in some cases. Both tests offer a manual method, um, which is a cut and weigh method. Um, procedure A or method A. Um, and both offer an automatic time flow measurement, procedure B um, or method B, which is a more automatic, automatic test. Um, there's really no consensus on which is best. Um, Procedure A is probably the best for organizations that do not test a whole lot or that use a very wide range of materials or different additives in their material, or they're using a lot of regrind or recycled material. Procedure B, um, again, is a more automated test, but it requires a melt density value to convert the volume measurement that occurs in procedure B back to a mass measurement. So you get your grants for 10 minutes uh, value that you're used to seeing. It is a more automated test, so there's less chance for operated error. And it's usually used by organizations that are testing the same material repeatedly. If you're a resin producer, uh, polyethylene, polypropylene, uh, there's no reason for you not to be using procedure B. Um, just to go over the procedures, uh, procedure A again is the manual cutoff test. Um, some people just call it a cut and weigh test. It's generally used with materials that have flow rates less than 25 grams per 10 minutes. Um, it requires the basic instrument and a test weight. You also need a gram scale, um, preferably one that has uh, a milligram resolution on it. And some materials are going to require special treatment um, before testing. For example, nylon and polycarbonate need to be dried before they're testing or before they're tested. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the general rule is if you if you uh, dry your material before you process it um, to make something, you need to dry it before you test it. So just basically how a, mel a procedure A runs, um, the manual cutoff, um, you know, amount of materials poured into a heated cylinder. Um, the amount that you charge is kind of uh, something that you have to figure out. It's going to change with um, um, the, the expected flow rate. Um, ASTM D1238 has a table in, in it. It gives you a little bit of guidance. Um, it's not perfect. Um, it gives you a wide range, but it gives you an idea of how much material you should charge based on your expected melt flow rate. <clears throat> Excuse me one minute. Excuse me, this is I haven't talked been so long since I've done one of these. I've, I've, my voice is uh, not as strong as it used to be. Uh, we'll get through it, though. So continuing with procedure A, um, you know, you, after you charge the material, you have a preheat time um, that's that's specified in the method uh, of seven minutes plus or minus um, 30 seconds. You also have a designated start point um, for the test, and you want to get to this spot. And the start point is uh, when the bottom of the piston foot is 46 millimeters above the top of the die. And there's scribe marks on our pistons that indicate uh, uh, where this start point is. Um, it's hard to see on this picture, but there are two scribe lines 
that are four millimeters apart. Um, they indicate the 46 millimeter start heart, start height with a two millimeter tolerance on it. So when you're doing a method A test, you want to try to get to that start point within the seven minutes plus or minus 30 seconds um, and start your test by making your first cut uh, after the first line disappears, but before the second line disappears. So after you make your first cut, um, and 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 in this and in this example, we're doing it one minute. If you have uh, some material that is a uh, fractional melt, you need to let it run longer, um, so that you get enough material to what to measure. So you actually have to do a test for six minutes. Conversely, if you have a higher flow material, you if you try to do it a minute, you won't have enough material left in the bore. So you have to cut that uh, time interval down to um, 30 seconds, sometimes even 15 seconds. So whatever time interval you use, um, you, you make that cut again at the end of it and you take that piece and weigh it. And in this case, again, since we did it for one minute, the, the, the amount of material is weighed and that value is then multiplied by a factor of 10 to give you your results for in grams per 10 minutes. Uh, procedure B, um, if you is a is again an automatic time flow test, it's a little bit easier to do and and, and takes away some of the um, um, operator involvement in it. Um, so you do require the basic instrument, of course, and then which you need to add on a timing instrument. Um, our timing instrument is called a programmable piston displacement transducer, um, but we simply refer to it as a PPDT or simply a switch. Um, this picture was not cr cropped correctly. There is an arm that goes off the uh, um, <coughs> the uh, encoder on the, that's mounted on the top of the furnace that uh, catches under the weight and records the time it takes for the piston to travel a certain distance. But these tests, basically they're figuring out, um, they're a volume test and you're getting your uh, your melt volume rate, your MVR test, just by doing a, 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 a method B test. This volume, again, we, we, we mentioned that you need a melt density value. Um, the melt density is used as a multiplier um, to convert the volume back into a mat. Now these tests can be used for any um, flow rate, um, but you when you start getting above with you start working with materials that have flow rates above 25 grams for 10 minutes, um, then you kind of have to do this way because there's no way you're going to get an accurate cut um on uh, fast flowing materials your hands are not calibrated uh, to work that fast <clears throat> just to talk about melt density uh, real quick um melt density is defined as the density of the molten polymer at a test at the at its test temperature and you have to know it or you can have to calculate it in order to use it for a proper procedure B test. Um, it's not the same as bulk density. A lot of times you'll see a density value on a COA or, or a technical specification sheet from a manufacturer um, that'll list a density value. Um, that's not the same thing. Melt densities are generally not uh, reported. <coughs> Um, there, there are in, in ASTM D 1238, if you're working with, uh, uh, virgin polypropylene and virgin polyethylene, they do give you a generic value, um, that you can use for the melt density that, 
pretty much all the resin manufacturers in North America do use that those generic values when they're doing their automated procedure B test. So in order to do the procedure to, to, to B test, you need the melt flow indexer, of course, and that has to be equipped with the timing mechanism. As we mentioned, you still need a test weight. Um, you still need a gram scale, particularly if you're calculating melt density. Um, and of course, if you're working with materials that need to be dried, you still have to do that. Um, now on this picture, this shows a, a, a MP1200 equipped with the motorized weight lift. We'll get into that a little bit more, but you don't necessarily need to have the motorized weight lift um, to do any of the testing. Um, we find that it does make testing a little bit easier and more consistent, and particularly if you're working with, say, high molecular weight polypropylene, where you have a 21.6 kilogram test load, <clears throat> we do divide those up into three weights, but still um, a lot of health and safety people start frowning on lifting that kind of weight above your head. Well, we'll talk about that a little bit later. So, um, in and again, this is when you're this this presentation is kind of again we talked about being um, <clears throat> two test methods ASTM D1238 and ISO 1133 <clears throat> being similar. Um, they're not the same, but um, this this uh, presentation kind of focuses on the ASTM uh, side of things a little bit more than it does on the ISO, but. Um, Within ASTM, um, you're again you're using um, the PPDT to measure the, the the time it takes for the piston to travel a certain distance. You have two um, distances that are specified within within the ASTM standard. <clears throat> They're a quarter inch or an inch. So you would use the quarter inch for lower flow um, uh, materials. And you can use the one inch travel for materials that have flow rates greater than 10. This, these are kind of arbitrary numbers. You can work with them. Like if you had a nine, you could do it either way. And there's, these are not hard and fast rules, but they're just a general idea. Um, these are just showing the calculation that is um, uh, used in procedure B in the ASTM method. Um, the 426 is a kind of a mean of the areas of the piston and cylinder times second and times 600. Again, this is taken directly from the ASTM standard. So we'll get into uh, some of the, the different uh, machines that Tinius Olson offers, uh, the different version. Is, as I mentioned, there's um, the base machine that we sell, uh, the MP1200, is shown there on the left-hand side of your screen. And then we get up to a, a machine with uh, the MP1200 with uh, the PPDT option. Uh, the motorized weight option and what we call the select selectable weight system that keeps all the weights up on top. Um, and the weights that you use are are um, selected with a spade. Both the all the models, the MP1200 um, programs work all the same way. Um, you um, have a uh, touch screen. Um, that's set up to um, guide the user through the test so that they do it the same way. You're able to enter um, identifiers. You're able to program limits to um, detect any kind of air bubbles that might occur. Um, you don't need a computer to run these these tests, uh, but uh, um, we do have a uh, built in PDF writer in here that can generate a, a fairly basic test um, 
or to basic test report that you can save down onto a USB key, or you can hook it with our uh, Horizon software and get a more uh, formal report and maintain data on a database. And we'll get into the Horizon a little bit later. So I'm just going back to this one. I guess the, the main thing to know is um, we we have kind of two versions of it. That one is the non-motorized version and the motorized version. Um, unfortunately, uh, if you cannot, you know, most of the accessories are modular, but you cannot add a motorized weightlift to a non-motorized machine at a later date. So if you want a motorized machine, you need to buy that up front. So the manual machine comes with everything that you need for the test, with, with the exception of the weights. We kind of sell the weights on a individual basis because not everybody needs all the weights, so we don't sell a set. We sell them individual weights. Um, you need a laboratory balance. Again, preferably something that's going to read out in milligrams. Um, we don't sell them either because most people have them uh, or they can get them locally. Um, it's a gravity based on a gravity gravity test. The test loads are applied manually, um, but it can be upgrade, upgraded to uh, add the PPDT on it or the timer, uh, which will allow you to do procedure B and C. Um, procedure C and is in ASTM D1238. That's the, basically the same test as procedure B, except you're using a different die. You're using what's called a half die. Um, and this is generally used for olefin testing um, for material that's very ultra high flow. Um, this was developed uh, while I was at ASTM in the last 30 years. Um, the idea was to, if you made a die that had an orifice that was half the height and half the length, or half the half the ID and half the length of the standard orifice that you would uh, slow down the material by half. It didn't quite work out that way. Um, it does it does slow it down, but it doesn't necessarily cut it in half. Um, but in order to do that, you just need to get a special die for that. Um, you can do both MFR and MVR. Um, uh, tests and you can uh, do melt density calculations if you have a material that uh, isn't polyethylene or polypropylene and you need to calculate it. You can do a melt density calculation test, which is basically a combination of the procedure A and procedure B tests. Uh, you do need to have the PPDT to do that because you have to measure piston travel, but you also want to make a cut and determine uh, the mass of the material that came out during piston travel. Um, the motorized machine um, is, is, again, it's not something that's required in, in standard. It's just a way of further automating the test. Um, it's nice in that you can um, program it to come to a certain height and stop and stay there during the preheat time. Um, so no matter what user, that if, you, if you have a, a lot of users, uh, um, that run the tests. Um, no matter who's running it, it's always going to do the same thing every time. And consistency is key to this test. So um, just like any other test that you do. Um, so the motorized machines come with all the options. Again, the programming's the same. Um, or I should say that the options are available to purchase. Um, not everybody gets all the options all the time. Most of the time, if they're buying a motorized machine, they are getting a PPDT, but we do have people that um, buy the motorized weight lift just to apply the weight when they're doing manual tests. That's certainly possible. Some other options we have, uh, we have an automated cutter. Uh, auto, we actually a manually driven cover and an automatic co cutter that can be programmed to um cut make the cut for you um i do caution you that while this sounds like a good idea it's not something that works with every material that's out there 
Um, you don't want to use it with high flow materials. You don't want to use it with sticky materials. And you don't want to use it with uh, material we would call tough or stuff that has impact modifiers on it because it ends up just bouncing off. Uh, some other options we have available. We have a flow rate ratio attachment that uh, we put on motorized machines. These are used mainly for um, the flow rate ratio test is probably something that it's not something that you see a lot on technical specs. It's usually used as an internal uh, quality control test in the polyethylene uh, resin manufacturing process. Um, we also do have a pneumatic purge and a pneumatic cleaning option. Uh, again, the the purge, the pur you can buy it. Um, you can buy it as on the clean and purge, or you can buy it as just a purge only. Uh, the purge again is nice. Um, it does. Um, it can be used to um, press the weight down um, to the platform. Um, when it's in the preheat position, and again, it makes sure that no matter uh, who you're having running, if you have a bunch of different operators running, um, you can um, always start at the same spot. And at the end of the test, it would help purge material out of the board that's left over from the test. Um, this is particularly useful when you're dealing with um, um, fractional melt materials that are really stiff and hard to push out of the material. So now we want to look at some um, of the best practices or our techniques that uh, um, kind of will ensure that you get better results or consistent results. Um, <clears throat> cleanliness is so key to this test um, and you can't overstate how important it is to have a machine clean um, for that so we'll focus on that quite a bit um, but you also need to be have the machine in good working order and it should be cal calibrated or verified Excuse me. Um, should be calibrated or verified, you know, both for temperature and physical dimensions and distance and time measurements on some sort of schedule. Um, we do offer in in, uh, in the U.S. We do offer a calibration service. We have customers that do it on a quarterly basis. Their calibrations and verifications. We have most commonly uh, used people that do it on an annual basis. Um, we but we even have people that do it on. Uh, a biannual uh, uh, basis. There's really no definition within the standards that says how often you should calibrate it. It's kind of left up to people's quality quality systems. But it should be done at, at, at on regular intervals. Again, cleanliness is probably the import, most important thing on these things, and you have to make sure that you clean each, the machine after each test thoroughly. Um, you want to clean the cylinder. You want to clean the piston foot. You want to clean the die. And um, you want to use the, uh, either a brass steel wool or a scotch Brite pad on the piston and 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 die and piston foot um, just to make sure it's clean uh, and then follow it up with a good uh, wipe down with a cotton cloth um, you need to clean the bore usually the, you clean it first with a cotton patch and you can also get brass brushes to further clean it um, and then follow that up with a with a cotton cleaning patch um, on our machines, we have a guide sleeve, uh, which is now designate, designated in the standards that you have that. Uh, you want to make sure that that's free to slide um, uh, freely um, 
um, and and you want and want you don't want it sticking in there and causing friction. You want to look at your orifice. Uh, you want to make sure it's clean. It should be cleaned down to bare metal. Um, and you want to make sure that the entrance is is not chipped or rounded. Um, just a little bit about how we do our pistons and dies. We do not serialize these, so we do not certify them, but each one of them is, is inspected before we ship it. Um, if you need to have some sort of traceability uh, on these, we suggest that you get a, a go, no go gauge that is is um, certified for dimensional ch checks. Also on our piston rods, we have a removable piston foot. Um, we do that for um, uh, to make it um, so that it's replaceable. We do consider the piston foot and the dies to be consumable items, meaning they're going to wear out uh, with even normal use. Um, uh, with unfilled materials. If you have filled materials, they're going to wear out faster, but we do um, suggest that you uh, maintain a supply of spare piston feet and spare dies so that you can always have one that's available that's going to be within uh, the, the definitions defined in the standard. The dies are the same yeah. for both ASTM and ISO. One of the tests is completed. Only the water vapor we have not completed because of the chamber. There are other tests ahead of. I'm sorry, was that a question or? All right, we'll move on. Uh, other things you want to do is check the barrel of the of the furnace on the machine. Again, it must be cleaned at each time. A good indication that it's clean is that when you drop a die into it, uh, you're going to hear it fall with an audible click, clicking noise. Um, in general, a barrel should be have a mirror finish and be free from scratches or rusts or any kind of other, you know, any other kind of defect on it. Um, this is the ID that's specified in, in uh, the standards for it. <clears throat> and when you calibrate it or verify it, we use a traceable bore gauge. Another thing is piston rod. You want to make sure it's straight. This is just a device that we use to check to make sure that it, it is straight from time to time. Um, normally, um, you don't have problems with bending rods, but uh, I have seen that uh, where that has occurred and been a problem. Again, our piston foot, we do consider it to be consumable as it will wear. If you look on the right side of this picture, you see the rounded edge versus the straight edge on an ASTM piston foot. But you also want to check your diameter of it. Um, again, here are what the what they specify in the standards, and you can just use a micrometer to check that to make sure you're within tolerance of it. You want to make sure it's clean. You want to make sure that this there's no edges on this. Well, one of the one of the things that happens is that if somebody drops the piston rod, or you bang it against the dent the bench or the machine, actually you'll cause this sharp edge to curl in. And the tolerances are very tight between the cylinder wall and the wall of the piston foot. So if this edge is broken out a little bit, it's just going to cause drag and it's going to give your lower flow results. Temperature, of course, uh, plays a big factor in this test. Um, in ASTM, you curr we're currently required to <clears throat> verify the temperature at two places in the bore. The critical one is 10 millimeters above the die.
excuse me, required to be within plus or minus 0.2 degrees C of the set point at 10 millimeters above the die, and then uh, 75 millimeters. Um, we're, we're required to be within plus or minus 1% of the set point. Now, this requirement has been in ASTM since um, the mid 1990s. <clears throat> There's a lot of older equipment out there yet that um, may not comply, uh, particularly with uh, being able to hold it to plus or minus 0.2 or within the plus or minus 1% at the higher uh, checkpoint. So it's always a good idea to make sure that the machine is calibrated and verified to a traceable source and that it's set properly to uh, the manufacturer's instructions. Um, for those running procedure B, um, you want to um, make sure that the switch, the PPDT is calculated calibrated and it's measuring accurately um, and that it's starting the test at uh, the proper starting point. Uh, again, for ASTM, it's 46 millimeters and you have a plus or minus two millimeter tolerances. Um, You can run a procedure test and do a, uh, and you know, you should get, if you run a procedure B test with the proper melt density value, you should get the same result as a manual cutoff test. So you can compare it that way if you'd like to. Some of the other things that might affect a test is power fluctuations in some areas. Um, you, you might have unstable electrical supplies, which will cause temperature issues with the machine and other performance issues. I know we, um, um, when we developed the MP1200, we spent a lot of time varying, throwing var various voltages and spikes at it and so forth so that it would handle handle um, these things much better. And it does, compared to some of our previous models, uh, handle power fluctuations a lot better, but it's not perfect. Um, other things you might cause some variations in your test uh, is the amount of material that you charge. Um, it's always a good idea to uh, use a scale or balance to weigh out your sample and use the same amount at the same time. Um, now, some people will take a clear vial and measure out the first amount that they use and then put a mark on that vial so that they can just dip it into their sample and fill it to their, their mark and you load it, that's fine. Um, you also want to make sure that your preheat time is uh, you're getting to the start point within the uh, start point of the test that you capture within the required in ASTM, it's seven minutes plus or minus 30 seconds. In ISO, it's five minutes. And you want to make sure that your temperature is going to be stable at that plus or minus 0.2 degrees C by the time the test starts. And again, ASTM specifies your preheat as 420 plus or minus 30 seconds for most materials. Now, there, we always tell people to refer back to material spec because there are materials that are temperature sensitive that they use a shorter preheat time. Um, Moisture for some materials such as ABS and nylon and um, polycarbonates and plexiglass and PET, they're hydrophilic and of course they're going to absorb moisture um, and this will affect your test results. Uh, so you need to dry these materials in some sort of oven prior to testing. Um, some of the stuff uh, PT is is they want you to dry it under a nitrogen purge, just that it's that moisture sensitive. So it also has to be um, when you're handling this material, you you have to almost take it right out of the uh, of the oven or whatever you're using to dry it and test it as soon as possible. You don't want to sit. You don't want to take um, 
the, the uh, material out, let it sit outside for a while, it will start um, sucking in moisture and that will affect the results. What usually happens if your material is wet, it's going to give you uh, um, air, a lot of air bubbles and it's going to flow at a higher rate than what you expect. Um, cutting techniques for procedure rate tests. Uh, uh, it's again, if you can't make an accurate cut on a on a high on a high flow material, um, but even when you're doing these lower lower flow materials, it takes some practice. Um, making the cut, it should be a clean cut along the bottom of the die. Um, pictured here is the is cutting it by hand. And you want to make sure you're doing it and it's, it's the required skill. You have to do it as soon as your the test starts or your capture period starts and as soon as it ends for accuracy. Um, for procedure B test, you want to make sure your, your switch, your PPDT is set up correctly and calibrated so that it's measuring a true either quarter inch or inch of travel. And again, going back to the overall. Um, sorry about that. Going back to the overall calibration, um, it's important to have that done periodically. And you want to, on a daily type basis, you want to make sure that you're inspecting all the components of the machine to make sure they're clean and not damaged and replace them as necessary. Um, some other things that, that can affect it. I, um, we don't, some people will clean their machines with some sort of solvent. Um, we don't necessarily recommend that. Um, we prefer the manual techniques of brass brushes and the cotton cleaning patches. Um, the reason we don't like uh, solvents because we have seen cases where people use solvents and that affects the results they get in in the, the testing that follows. It can uh, either speed it up or slow it down from the expected rate. So, um, but that doesn't mean that people don't do it. I'm, in 30 years, I've seen anything from water to floor wax stripper used um, on uh, components through the die or the melt indexer. Um, but again, I if we don't recommend it, so. Um, so that's that's pretty much what I had. I can I can start talking to you a little bit more about uh, Tinius Olson um, and how we do it as as we make we make other machines besides the melt flow, we make tensile machines, we make uh, Izod and Sharpie machines, um, and we kind of work with you. We're, like I said, we're small enough, and we we try and stay in contact with all the all the, our customers through the ASTM and ISO process, so we learn what, what people need and what they're looking for, and uh, we try and, again, work with you and 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 be a partner in what you're in your testing. So um, all our uh, materials are, are all our machines are linked together through Horizon software, um, our Horizon software. Um, it's designed to work with uh, all our machines, our tensile machines, our impact machines, our heat distortion, FICAP machines, and our melt flow testers. Um, it's power, actually a powerful tool. It, it really is in, in simplicity. There's there's two sides of it. There's a a um, a testing side and a database side that maintains your data locally, and that can be exported out to um, your your LIM system. Your you can actually send reports to uh, your supervisors. Your quality manager, your lab manager, you can have them done 
when the test is done, they can send it to you. Um, and it, again, it works with all of our machines. It works with our metals testing machines and, and our impact machines, our plastic impacts, melt flow, again, our HDT, FICAT machine. Um, you know, here with the melt index and melt flow, you're getting single results, but with with things like the tensile machines, tensile flex, and the HDT, you can get graphical results. Um, it connects with all extensometers. And it's just a very powerful data collection tool. Just to sum it up, uh, what, what we offer on it, uh, we have uh, security uh, multi-levels. We can set it at various levels depending on what you're comfortable with. It works with Windows 10. Uh, a real nice feature, particularly when you're working with the tensile machines, is a touch screen um, where you can enter uh, data and control the machine, the up and down movements just from the touch screen. Um, we can connect multiple machines of multiple types to the software at the same time. So you, know, you might have your melt flow connected with a impact tester. Or you know, you can do it that way. Or you might have um, five melt indexers connected to one PC. <clears throat> it's very user friendly. It's got an easy to use startup menu. We supply a um, searchable test method library with it to give you templates for your tests. Um, you can preview your method and also your output. Uh, or you can build your own test method if you want. We can set um, test limits for pass fail. Again, for melt flow, it, it's useful in uh, detecting any kind of air bubbles that might be in the test. Um, we can make customized report uh, layouts for you. Uh, we can incorporate your logo onto the test report. Um, we do have a very wide range of output options as far as generating it out in HTML or PDF or directly to our printer. Uh, we do consolidate some test reports. We offer, the Horizon offers a, a recall function and you can regenerate and reprint results. Um, we do have a networking and uh, uh, ability to network, put this on the network, and we also have the ability to run demo and off, offline use, meaning that uh, a lab supervisor can install it on their desktop, on their office desk, and be able to look at the test results that are generated uh, from the testing machine. Um, when it's set up property, properly, um, you can get a test and report with just four clicks of the mouth. And then all of it's supported by uh, the Tinius Olson Help Desk, which is uh, um, located in the UK and the US. Um, <clears throat> In the U.S., of course, I'm most familiar with. We have uh, six people sitting there to answer your calls, and they're busy all day long answer calls and helping people with the testing. Um, we also are now offering, and something new that we're offering, is a video extensometer um, for tensile tests. And it's just a list of some of our our key clients for melt flows. You know, it's 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 is interesting how the industry has changed. You know, when I first got into this 30 years ago, you know, you were always dealing with the bigger companies that you know had the money for equipment. But particularly with melt flows, we're selling a lot of machines to much smaller companies. Um, some of the resources we have available, we have a school of testing area. 
where you can get some features on the MP1200 um, regarding the temperature control, the automatic cutter, the operation of the machine, the PPDT, the motorized weightlift, and Horizon. Um, again, these are the kind of the machines that we offer, which is a sample of some of them. And again, what's really nice about this, particularly if you have a need to do a, a, a melt flow, heat distortion, impact, tension, and, and, and flex tests, Horizon, again, is, is will run all these machines. It's really nice that you don't have to spend a lot of time learning five different softwares um, um, when the, the the feel of, of, of the way Horizon runs is going to work um, the same way for all the tests. So that's all I have here. Um, are there any questions out there? And Alice, I'll have to ask you to help me with getting those those together if there are any questions. Yeah, Hi, thanks. Mr. Yeah, thanks, Harry. Um, I see there are a couple of good questions in the uh, chat box. Uh, there was one early question from ZX. Um, who's asking about how do we get a traceable calibration for ISO and ASTM standard, and if there are, if there are any parameters we need to calibrate? Um, there are a, if you read through the standards, there are, a, there are a bunch of areas that say that the machine shall do this, like it shall control temperature within plus or minus 0.2 at 10 millimeters above the of the of the die, and plus or minus one percent of the set point at 75 millimeters above the die. Again, this is going for ASTM. ISO is a little bit different, um, but we do both ASTM and ISO calibrations. But we're we're in addition to temperature, we're checking dimensions, um, <clears throat> we're checking um, masses, we're checking um, uh, travel to make sure that it's correct. So, um, Tinius Olson's calibration service is accredited to uh, ISO 17025. So all our equipment that we use to calibrate is traceable. So if you're buying a new machine, then um, what you what you need to do is just tell us that which one you want, or if you want both of those calibrations when you're when you're getting a new machine. Right. Um, thanks. Thanks, Harry. Um, there was another question where uh, Mr. JM is asked, is there a standard document stating drawing conditions are required for different materials before we start the test? There's nothing out there um, that says how you should dry it that I'm aware of. Um, Again, it comes down to the rule of thumb. If you dry your, your material before you make something out of it, you need to dry it before you test it. So, um, you know, uh, but how dry is dry, that starts to get into, again, again it, you should be consistent. It, it's always a good idea to check your moisture content on it and dry it down to a certain level. But again, you can't. You cannot um, wait too long between taking the material out of the oven and, and testing it. Um, in some cases, it, 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 it's only a matter of minutes before you're start, going to start affecting your results.
did that answer the question or? Hi, Harry. There are another question from Richard uh, is that what do you advise when conduct tests for virgin raisin compared to process raisin after molding? Is 10% variable is acceptable? I have to refer you to the precision and bias statements in in both ASTM and ISO 1133. Um, if you look at the the one in in ASTM, there's a lot of variation in there for some materials and. I've I've actually seen some national standards that tell you that to expect a 10% uh, variation in in your results. <clears throat> and you you got to remember they call this test an index test for a reason. It's not an absolute. Um, uh, if you're going to have filled materials, you're going to see a lot more variation than you would on just virgin materials. Um, so it's it's there's it's really hard to quantify it. If you look at again at those P and B statements, particularly in ASTM, um, there that data was probably run in the 80s. Um, there have been a lot of improvements to um, um, ASTM D1238 over the years, and you know with a lot of people being certified to ISO 17025 now. I certainly expect that you can get better than 10% variation on some of these things, but there are materials that that are going to um, uh, be variable. It's 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 a hard thing to pin down, but I think you know if you watch what you're doing and and kind of be consistent between operator to operator and from laboratory to laboratory, you have a much better chance of getting better results. Okay, thanks, Harry. And there's also, there's also other question from Aziz. Uh, the first question, there are several questions from Aziz. I think the first question is, uh, how critical is piston foot diameter affecting test result? We have experienced difficulty to get stable data, especially for high melt flow material that greater than 50 gram per minute with slight changes of piston foot diameter worn out. Um, I think it's critical. Um, how much it's affected you is hard to say. But what I have seen is, you know, if you don't clean that piston foot and you allow the material to build up, um, it's going to drag between the piston, the, the, the wall of the piston foot and the wall of the cylinder, and that's going to cause friction and that's going to give you lower results. Now, if you get it to the point where you clean the thing too hard, where it becomes um, below, you know, below the, the list and thighs, it's then you're going to have start material flowing past it. And again, that's going to affect your results. So it's pretty critical to check that, you know, I'm not saying you got to check it after every test, um, but, you know, at some regular interval, you should be checking that. If it's the end of a shift or the end of a day or at the end of the week, it all again, it all depends on your material and how good your operators are. But there should be some kind of schedule where you're checking that. <clears throat> All right. Um, and there's another, uh, a second question from Aziz as well. Is like, uh, we have method measure, we have method where we do two measurement with two different weight load at one testing. In this case, we do measure with 21 kilogram and 5 kilogram. Is the second measurement considered valid in terms of the starting measurement point less than 46 mm? No. I guess the short answer is no. Um, unless the whatever one that you're, you're having, and it all depends on how you're setting it up. If you're setting it up so your heavy load 
um, starts the test at 46 millimeter, which most of them don't, um, I guess it would be acceptable. But most people will use the, the, the heavy load as a kind of a pre-purge and then use the lighter load as their actual test value. Um, again, there is a, in, in within ASTM, the flow rate ratio test is is covered under procedure D in ASTM D1238. It's <clears throat> it's not meant to be a way to get two results out of one one test because um, you want to make sure that you have the right preheat time and your right starting point. So if you're if you do that and you are reporting you you say that um i'm getting my value under the 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 two point the i2 or the 2.16 kilogram loads but you want to make sure you report that you're doing procedure d of the stm test i hope that was clear Okay, there are more questions at the bottom. So uh, maybe right now I read out. There's another question from Iru from Lotte. So Iru asks, hi, Harry, how is the starting point of 46 mm plus minus 2 mm above upper face of the die will affect the result? Is procedure A and B need to meet the required starting point or only method A? No, they're, they're, the, I mean, the, the starting points, the test loads, and the temperature are all standard no matter what procedure you're using. Either, you know, in, in, in procedure A, you're, all, you're still going to start at 46, um, and procedure B, you're both going to start at 46. Now, that's, that's, a, that's a little bit difference between ASTM and ISO. Um, when we talk about procedural differences, ASTM will start at 46, where the ISO test starts at 50 millimeters above the die. And that little difference can, you know, in, in position, can make a difference in your actual test result. So you want to make sure that you, you're using the same methods between comparing labs that are comparing against one of each other and make sure you're starting at the same point. Okay, thanks, Harry. I think um, that is already the last question. Uh, there's no more question in the chat room. And I think for the rest of the participants, if you have more question after this uh, webinar, uh, you may uh, send an email to us and we will uh, get you the information. Uh, we will revert the information via email after this. Yeah. Okay, uh, for Jason, you have anything else uh, you want to continue? Yes, Kelly. Hello. 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 I hear you. Can hear you. Can hear you. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, for us, for us to improve our future web, Mina, uh, Alex, can you? Full slide the presentation. Okay, hold on. I full. Hmm. Yes, already full screen. All right. Finally, uh, actually, we are coming to the end of the webinar, but we have a little bit delay about uh, for about what half an hour. Okay, for us to improve for our future webinar, please be reminded to fill up the webinar feedback form in the chat box. My colleague already already uh already sent in the link yeah already send the in the link in upon the, the completion box. upon the completion of the survey form right you will be receiving the webinar recording as well as the presentation slides and the e-certificate from us for for the joining of this webinar for all the questions that you are still interested to ask you you can ask our team in the survey form comment section or send an email to us at info alliance nexus analytics dot com dot my last but not least if you wish to stay informed for our web upcoming webinar and announcement and letters update please follow our social media 
the Facebook and the LinkedIn by scanning the QR code in the presentation slide. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for joining us. See you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Harry, for giving a fruitful presentation on the MFI. You're welcome. That's uh, my pleasure. I'm glad it, I hope people found it useful. Sorry, my voice kind of was, was dying there. Hi, Harry. Thank you so much for doing this uh, great presentation. I think mm -hmm. it is very late for you already, 9.30. Yeah, it's still early. Yeah. <laughs> I hope it was useful. I hope it's what you wanted. Um, I know it was.